Okay, chat. So, the time has come to give the final thoughts on Wild Arms 2. I'm not even sure where to begin with it. I, I guess if I had to do the quickest thing and easiest thing to say of whether I would recommend this game or not, the short answer is no. I feel like there are a lot of flaws with it that really hold it back. There are sections of the game that definitely feel like they are meant to be, like, almost strategy guide-esque in terms of uh, learning how certain items work or finding abilities for a specific late game character. And honestly, some of the puzzles, well, we'll talk about the puzzles in depth for sure. But and honestly, some of the puzzles were kind of obtuse, even more so than normal puzzle games. So from that standpoint, I, I don't think I could recommend it. So let, let's give an overview of what kind of game it is for those that would like to continue beyond that general opinion. Wild Arms 2 is kind of a loose sequel to the first game. We build up a party of characters that each have unique abilities, some have magic, some have access to guns. It's a turn-based game that favors characters having uh, unique tools to navigate dungeons. So potentially, for example, if you're, you're a mage character with the fire rod, you can light torches or use ice to freeze things in place. I like the concept of it. I, I did enjoy Wild Arms 1. I cannot say the same about Wild Arms 2 start to finish. I think one of the most immediately obvious problems with the setup of continuing in the same universe is definitely the translation. Within the first couple of scenes of the game, not even really spoilery, when you choose your initial character before they inevitably meet up in order to form a larger party, the translation is just so all over the place. Or if he's saying if they remaster Wild Arms soon and fix the 3Dness and translation, I'd recommend that. I don't even know if that would fix the game. I honestly think it needs an overhaul start to finish. Like, if it's basically completely redo the game, I would agree with you. There, there's so much that needs fixing. We'll, we'll take it a step at a time. The problem with the translation is that it's, it's not necessarily broken English. There's just a lot of things that they just seem to be saying things with no context. And some of that is due to word choice issues. In particular, by the end of the game, like, the very first hour of the game and the last hour of the game in terms of plot, man, those sentences were, like, almost unnavigatable. Like, there are certain characters that make sense, like, they're giving you directions or whatever, and then other times they're just, like, shouting names. Apparently that was supposed to be a translation from a guard to, I think, shout surprise, for example. So it just, it, it sounded like they were just calling someone's name versus, like, saying, like, halt or attention or whatever they were trying to say. And so it's just kind of like, yeah. Then there's characters where, like, they definitely just kind of made dialogue up and it made no sense. Murphy referencing one particular reoccurring character, Liz, that was li literally gibberish. I barely understood what that character was supposed to be saying at any given time. So there's definitely a big translation issue throughout the game. And it affects some characters more heavily than others. I think for the most part, the main plot is mostly understandable, minus the whatever the word salad was at the end of the game. Um, so it, it's enough that you'll still follow along, but you're going to be scratching your head a lot. Yeah, and then like the weird things where they put like parentheses, where like, they're like, that's my favorite woman, parentheses person. <laughs> I'm like, who, what is this translation supposed, like, did they leave in translator notes? Like, honestly, super confused. So it's definitely hard to get into it. Dumbfounded silence. Oh, that was that was the favorite one. Thank you for bringing that up. I almost forgot about that. They literally put the words in square brackets, dumbfounded silence. It's like amazing. It, so like sometimes it becomes funny when it just goes like so poor quality that it's like clearly something happened. Like there's no way this would normally pass uh, the muster of anything else. But yeah, it's more entertaining than it sounds. Th those were the highlights in like a, a dredge of dialogue. So it's hard to get into it from a plot perspective. So it's kind of... I think that definitely took me out of it in general, but without even going into specific characters. That definitely took me out of the game pretty early in terms of like investment. I think where like... I will give a positive thing. 
because we're, we're going to try to mix it a little bit. I'll try to do some positive and negatives to kind of mix it up. I do think the soundtrack to this game is really good. I think that's like one of the few shining moments of the game. Music pretty solid throughout. Shoutouts to the composer. They did really well. We're, we're talking about JoJo tension sound effects for some reason in the chat. Do the Japanese onomatopoeia. But from that standpoint, it's like where you have something really solid, like the music I think throughout is really, really solid. I don't know if I'm going to like listen to it necessarily outside the game itself, but I think it definitely served its purpose. I can identify most of these songs as potentially from Wild Arms. Indeed, there are more Wild Arm games. But from the standpoint of like everything else, like our introduction to the game being uh, the magician character, Vicky, who we named her in reference to Suikoden, since she literally is just a gimmick of that character. Let's be honest, chat. She even has the blinking mirror equivalency. She is definitely that character from Suikoden. Um, from the standpoint of her first introduction into the game, I feel like that was one of the worst openings to a game I have, I have seen in a long time. I mean, that was rivaling Castlevania 64 for worst cold open of all time on stream. Like, that was... that was painful. Learning to grapple with the really awkward camera and, like, the... The sprites are 3D, but the area is 3D, and then the camera angle doesn't quite show you what you need to see. It was really bad, chat. I, I don't know... I, I, I'm sure there are people that will defend it, but it very much had extremely rough transition into 3D. And honestly, like, compared to, like, navigating Wild Arms 1, I like the Wild Arms 1 better, even though it looked more awkward, where the characters were 3D in a 2D world. I don't think the reverse worked very well in this game, to be honest, start to finish. Murphy explaining that it's a long, awkward silence is an onomatopoeia. Maybe. That's probably what happened. But I think from that standpoint, it's just kind of like... Things are just... Like, every time you, you find, like, something you start to like about the game, something weird goes wrong. So, like, something I feel neutral about before we go to something positive. The combat system. I liked the idea of them potentially simplifying things down like you know you don't necessarily need a force gauge which builds up a super meter in which you can use intervals of 25 to do a super attack specific to the character and getting rid of something like mp so spellcasters can use their spells more consistently throughout the battle so you don't have to worry about the resource struggling there the problem with that is that it felt like the spellcasters were just kind of bad for like half of the game to like borderline unplayable. So what do I mean by that? Especially if you compare it to Wild Arms 1, like I would think one of the core abilities of a spellcaster, if not to hit weaknesses, which they, they did do even early on, is to be able to deal with AoE. And honestly, it took a really long time to get an AoE spell. And instead, the AoE were the characters that were already outputting massive damage with physical attacks. So the early portion of the game in turn of balance was like, you take a really crappy healer that can't do anything for like two to three turns in combat that only lasts two to three turns. And they're basically just like dead useless until they hit higher levels where the minimum force gauge you start with is completely one-to-one -one with your level. So unless you have, like, a really cheap AoE spell, which no one had, you had to be at least 47 for this to happen in a game where we only hit, like, 58 after the optional bosses, well, most of the optional bosses, it just led to, like, this really awkward power dynamic. And then, like, I like that they brought back the arms, because I think that's, like, one of the things that identifies this game over a JRPG. Like, the ability to put ammo into the gun, so it, it's kind of like spells for melee characters. You have a mix of, do I normal attack to build meter, or do I use the gun for more damage? I think that was a positive in the system. Where I think it was negative is that by, like, roughly the midway point in the game, what was the point of using arms at all? I don't feel like a lot of the systems really blended very well with each other. 
Like to me, it felt it felt so weird that I literally would do like eight times more damage on a normal attack than using arms and build meter, because so many of the systems are so inter in dependent on you hitting things like weakness, which is only possible with elemental rings and a hidden shop. Good luck with that, by the way. Hope you find that in your playthrough, where you're gonna have quote unquote a long and fun time with some of those optional bosses. Um. From that standpoint, I mean, at the end of the game, I used one arm attack between, like, seven bosses. Just one? Like, that was it? <laughs> I don't know, chat. It just felt really weird. Like, think about the power dynamic in Wild Arms 1, which is the easiest comparison. It's the same game in the series, where, like, I would basically not n use normal attacks at all, which, you know, maybe some people see that as a downside. But the plus side... If I use things like bullet clips to reload the ammo, I was then thinking about how I wanted to use resources. This game, I basically only normal attacked or spammed FP recovery towards the end of the game, which was pretty easy to get towards the end of the game, to be honest. But like, then it was, do I apply elemental attacks to my normal attacks or not bother at all because the character is useless, which is a pretty terrible game feel. Let's be very clear, I don't think that balance system worked at all. I would really hope that they rethink it a bit more for Wild Arms 3. I think normal attacks building meter was fine. I don't think it makes sense that normal attacks were out damaging guns that you spend literally potentially hundreds of thousands of money on to upgrade. I don't think that makes any sense at all, comparatively, in, in the game universe or from like a balance perspective. So honestly, outside of like the first maybe third of the game, uh, arms just kind of fall off a cliff and I don't bother using them because they're not required at all, nor do they really do that much more damage. And I think another big issue that hurt it and with the arms... Uh, oh, so speaking of which, speaking of one more negative thing with the arms upgrade, I hated that the game didn't tell us there was a cap because in the first game, you could cap everything. So you could cap the bullets, the clip size, and the damage. And that was fine. If you grinded in the game, you were preparing for a bonus boss, great. You had something that scaled with the time you spent with the game. In this game, you only get 10 weapon levels, and you can't reconfigure it. And if you learn that the hard way, like, like we did, we ended up having basically useless weapons for a majority of the game. And the small damage increase they did have from basically maxing accuracy and putting a little bit of damage was not worth that over a normal attack by about the, 30, the third of uh, the way through the game, which is kind of a big problem. So I'm hoping in Wild Arms 3, they wise up and let you redistribute points. I don't care that there's a limitation. I just think it made no sense to limit the player and then not explain that very, very explicitly. So reconfiguring would have been super great and I would have been able to play with abilities that you don't know about until you get later in the game. Like, for example, there's an ability called Full Clip, where your damage is based on the number of bullets in order to deal damage to an enemy, which potentially gives a use for the Force Gauge and guns. But the problem? You get this towards the end of the game, and if you've been specking basically damage, because most of the time bosses don't live more than three or four shots by the first third mark of the game, then you don't have the bullets to scale the damage. So, like... A lot of it just kind of feels like unfair guesswork on the player's behalf. And that's why at several points I feel like it, it's a strategy guide game. Where like there are things that like would have been really nice to know early on. And definitely would affect like a new game plus. But the way those mechanics are introduced end up being just like a total mess going in blind. Where they're not necessarily terrible on their own. But given the lack of information and context, it's just kind of brutal. Strategy guy gamer, please play this game seven times to figure everything out kind of game. Exactly. There's a lot of abilities you get really, really, really late in the game where, like, the time it would take to learn these is not organic to the play time spent. So what do I mean by that? Early on in the game, you're given one weapon at a time. You're given only a couple of spells at a time through things like crests. So you have time to use it and, and test it. And generally, for the most part, when you get an ability, you can use it right away. The problem is that they start introducing things that are like, oh, uh, did you spend 75 meter on this? Well, we're going to decide that 
if you have a specific stat booster equipped, it's going to do a special effect. But we're not going to tell you what that special effect is in the menus. You're going to have to build potentially 75 meter, which means blocking three or four turns with the character or spamming uh, force gauge recovery in order to get to that point where you can use it. And then you have like 20 different things it can do. And then we're not, it's still not going to describe when you assign that to your character, what that will do for you. You're just going to have to remember all of this. And then we're going to do this on like a third of the, a third to a half of the characters in the game, which it felt terrible. Like, let's be real honest. I, I think like a big misstep too, in terms of like an example of like, what would have been cool or good, and I like the idea of it, but the execution failed. Before we go on to a positive point to balance out all the negatives, um, the concept of having a blue mage character. So there's an optional character in the game that can learn abilities from enemies. The problem, you get this character basically in the final quarter of the game. The enemy abilities are really scattered throughout the world. There are not enemies that give you repeat abilities. There are many enemies that give you no abilities at all. So you might go in a dungeon and apply this ability, because you know, you have like six to 10 dungeons left in the game and you're done. They're not like crazy, crazy long dungeons either. You might get one ability a dungeon, maybe. You might get one in the overworld, but like, is it realistic to expect players without a guide to go to every single corner of the overworld and fight potentially rare enemies you may or may not even know about. Like, for example, the Necronomicon is an example of an enemy where we almost didn't encounter it at all in the playthrough, despite being in that area for like an hour and a half. Or things like going all the way back to the first dungeon in the game in order to get an ability. Like, that's actually madness. That is actual madness. Yeah, like, this is, like, there's, like, little small things that could have fixed it, right? Like, I think we talked on stream. If they had just been, like, a class of enemies gives you one ability, then you know based off of their class that you have that ability, that would have worked at the point that they put us in the game. Or, if, that, if we had started with that character and we're allowed to naturally progress through the dungeon, we could use that character as we came across enemies and naturally get the abilities as we play. So we see it for the first time, you know, and we grab the ability potentially, but that's not what they did. And that's a big problem I have with this game where there's just a lot of things that don't really show up until late and they just don't really go well with each other. So let's talk about a positive. I do think from the standpoint of combat, I think some of the menus were mostly fine. I'm definitely happy to be able to swap out accessories or potentially the stat boosters, aka the guardians, so I can adapt to the situation rather than just getting a really harsh game over on a boss. So for example, if I see a boss is starting to spam an elemental move, I could go, okay, I'm at the end of the game, I have some elemental resistance, or uh, I could be like, oh, I want to learn a different ability or I might need to use another passive ability unlocked by having a stat booster in one of our slots. Let's go ahead and put that one in the battle because I'd like to steal to see if they have anything interesting. So I think there were elements of it that I think were pretty solid. But again, it kind of comes down to still a lot of clunkiness. Battle speed in this game is kind of slow. It's not the slowest I've seen, but I'm going to put it in like low, low medium speed versus like low or like lowest speed we've seen. Some of the spell animations can take quite a long time, upwards of like eight seconds, which does really drag when that's your only spell and you're playing a spellcaster. If we get like the critical animation, if we get a nice little animation of like a multi stab, but again, it's like a one second slice to like a four and a half, five second animation. And it, it does really drag in a game where there's a lot of encounters. Well, actually, speaking of one more positive thing about encounter, one more positive thing before we go back to critical, I do like that in the overworld and in dungeon navigation, you have the ability to see an encounter is coming for the most part and hit a button to skip the encounter. 
I think that was a big quality of life change to remove some of the tedium of the slightly slower battle system. However, since we're on the tangent of the overworld, we're introduced with one of my least favorite gimmicks of all time in RPGs. I absolutely hated the, the search system. I thought it was stupid. I think it was one of the most unnecessary things I have ever seen in an RPG. I hated it. <laughs> I hated it, chat. For those that don't know what I'm talking about, you have to continually press like the square button in order to do like a pulse to search for things near you. I don't mean for hidden items. I mean for even basic things like towns, not hidden dungeons, not like alternate passageways, towns. And then your character is like so stupid that unless you read signs to tell you there's a town, you can't find the town. I'm like, what are you blind? Why do I need to do this? <laughs> what a bad inclusion. I really hope this does not appear in the later Wild Arms. That definitely put me in a bad mood where it was like, literally you're sometimes looking for a dungeon and you know vaguely where it is, but because you're scanning a smaller area on the overworld, you're just constantly hitting the square button like an idiot looking for like, oh, is this a slightly different color terrain? Oh, do I think it's this part of the mountain that has a cave? They're like, oh my gosh, I didn't see that seven story tall tower until someone told me where it was. Like, that was just ridiculous. That was ridiculously bad. I really dislike that system entirely. Towards the middle of the game, it becomes more bearable when it puts the point on the map where the thing you can search is. That should have been a default. You shouldn't have to search for things like that. I'm not sorry. How do we not see an eight-story tower in the middle of an ocean? Like, what are we, dumb? Like, what is going on? You knew vaguely where it is, despite the game's best attempts at stopping you with poor directions. Oh, the bad directions continue in this game. Wild Arms 1 sent us on some bad overworld directions where they're saying like, oh, it's near so-and-so, and then it's nowhere near so-and-so. That happened again in Wild Arms 2, unfortunately, more than once. Very annoying. I like the one where they said it was like, oh, it's near the southeast city. And then like the thing we're looking for is like dead center, if not slightly north of center in the continent. Like they're they are not that close. <laughs> Be very clear. Like they are not that close to each other. Ridiculous. Um, let, Let's go back to things where I'm mixed. So let, let's go back to positives and negatives. Positives. I like that there are level up points. So potentially we could customize our character. I like the concept of it. Negative. Everything else about that system. I felt like... One, some of the descriptions were very vague. Two, a lot of decisions you have to make are based off of things you won't know about unless you've played the game before. Like, do you know how relevant sudden death attacks are, or disease, or paralysis will be, unless you've played the game before? And then, like, why put those kinds of choices in there when there are, like, borderline mandatory choices? Like, imagine playing this game, Chad, and never taking HP up. Like, that feels like one of the most mandatory auto-pick skills in the game. So I feel like if... If you're playing a melee character, you're playing a mage, the first like 20 levels are gonna be same for those the two types of characters, right? Like you're just gonna get HP up, magic up. Congratulations. You need like four levels a point. So you just spent 20 levels doing the same thing on both characters. And then from there, it doesn't really improve too much more. Like you're going to probably wanna get the defensive skills pretty early. So you're also going to take both of those on both sets of characters. And then that leaves you with, oh, you're like level 30 and you're like more than halfway through the game in levels. And you haven't really made a choice because there's an option that seems so mandatory that it, it sh overshadows everything. I would rather have those abilities been reassignable, which again, would potentially fix the issue to some extent. But more importantly, I don't think things that are raw stat boosts or things like where if you don't get them early, you don't benefit from them. Like HP up requiring you to take it early is ludicrous, for example. Um, I feel like it should have been like an emphasis on 
different styles of combat, but not to the point where something feels like completely mandatory. Like, I like the ability to potentially pick and choose your resistances, depending on what kind of dungeon you're in. I like potentially being able to gear up for that, where like, it's not like an overwhelmingly powerful effect, but it can be useful if you take a little bit of a look ahead or you're on like a new game plus. I think, for example, like being able to do critical attacks would have been an example of something I think is interesting that I don't feel is like a mandatory pick for any character. I would have rather had choices like that that felt more meaningful. Like, for example, there's ones where it's like it reduces FP costs after you use things. But with 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 the game, with the way the game works, if you have a force gauge of 20 and your spell costs 20, as an example, not being literal here, if you use the spell, it doesn't use up the force gauge. So things that reduce like the force gauge costs don't really come up that often in general. I think it would have been much more useful to potentially have like percentage based cost reduction. And being able to reassign that later in the game would have been an interesting choice to make. As an example of something that's not directly a stat per se, but would not necessarily feel mandatory either, depending on what you found in the game. And I feel like those kinds of things are the problem with the game, where I just don't feel like there's a lot of... Like, there's a lot of subsystems, but they don't really have any cohesion with each other. Like, I don't even remember what, like, 40 of the... or 30 of those skills are, aside from the stat-up ones. Because those are the ones that were, like, 100% mandatory. And there seemed to be no reason to pick the other ones at all at where we were in the game. And by the time we get to the end of the game, where we finally have the freedom of choice to assign our abilities, I don't really need those other skills at all. With maybe the exception of doing a final boss, or literally the optional bosses. So I just don't feel like there was any cohesion from that system at all with how the rest of the game played out or came out. There's a lot of things where the numbers aren't ever big enough to matter. Yeah, that's also true. Like, I like the one where it's like you could recover your your force gauge between battles, every battle. But then it's like it heals you 60 health towards the end of the game when you have 8,000 health. It definitely scales super terribly on most of the abilities. I had a question, is completing 100% of the game unlock the true ending? I don't think there's more than one ending, to be honest with you. This, this does not seem like a game that does it. Wild Arms 1 did not have a true ending. Is that why this feeling of a meaningless endgame? No, it's just, it's not balanced properly. And that's where I want people to really think about it when people were coming in to defend on stream the game while we played. Like, it has a really big mechanical problem. I'm not saying that some things don't work together, but like, unless you have literally played the game to its conclusion before and or have a strategy guide, a lot of these things that you might have not had any use for for the first 65% of the game, is suddenly relevant for two battles, and then never relevant again. So it just feels kind of like a weird knowledge check to make in this kind of game, where you're making choices literally so far in advance, without knowing what the game itself is going to be like. It's not a good feeling from a blind player perspective. I think another big issue uh, with the level ups in general is that we saw... <laughs> is that we saw some issues with spell abilities. So I want to briefly touch about spell abilities one more time. Because they remove things like MP from this game, I'm also not able to make any interesting decisions for like the first 15 hours to 20 hours of the game. Now, that time range might reduce a little bit since I'm vocalizing the dialogue, so obviously I'm going to go slower than people that are just reading it or skipping or skimming dialogue. But from the standpoint of gameplay when I was like below level 30, I'm not able to basically do any interesting spell choices, and things like the crest system on your mage character just end up being like, hey, do you, do you see an enemy that has really high defense? Remember in Wild Arms 1 where one of your basic abilities was to be able to lower their defense? Well, great, we made that cost 70 points for some reason, so unless you're fighting a boss, that's never going to be relevant in normal combat. And then even on boss fights, some bosses might not last long enough for that to get to that point. It just felt really weird, like the, the price of some of these abilities just did not match their usefulness. The ability for these uh, debuffs to whiff is painful. 
that felt super bad. I mean, I think how many times did we have chat tell telling me to do like the speed down on the optional bosses? It literally never worked. <laughs> it was like 0 for 12, chat. Like it, it never worked on any boss. Like, oh, do we see a boss is out speeding me? So I'd like to go first so I'd be able to out heal. Nah, we're just going to let it not work at all. I don't know due to RNG or just straight up immunity. Frankly, from a blind player experience, it doesn't matter. Well, developing Wild Arms 1, we learn a lot from our mistakes of Wild Arms 2. Yeah, like a lot of it just feels so backwards. Like the whole point in Wild Arms 1 is that you didn't get AOE guns until the end and they were like your big bang. Now you could quickly clear encounters and feel good about the character. This one, they gave them to you early and then spellcasters were just literal dead weight I'd never wanted in the party. The only thing they were kind of decent at was healing, or if it had a super obvious weakness, then I might use it. So even though positive, you could rotate out the party, negative, there's really no point to it most of the time uh, through majority of the game. Maybe it'll save you a little bit in the optional bosses, uh, but not really required throughout the game, sadly. In, in terms of like optimization, it was just kind of very mediocre in most situations. For the one time we get go over leveled, what's his name? Yeah, there's there's quite a few exploits in the game. We did find a couple of ways to skip puzzles, which again, I'm gonna withhold on talking about puzzles because we're gonna talk about that for like 40 minutes. Uh, but yeah, we found some pretty exploitable AI. And speaking of problems with this game, I'm gonna call it out for what it is. I love the introduction to the boss monsters. I like that little title card that pops up. I like that little silhouette against the red background. That was like personality in the game that makes the boss fights a lot more memorable. Downside, actual AI of the bosses. <laughs> like, I, I, I think the monster design, like the actual look also for the most part was decent to good for the most part, for, especially for a PS1 3D game. But man, it was just like... At least three quarters of the bosses in the game can be summarized as thus. To seventh moon for sure. Normal attack. Heavy attack that hits one person. Status ailment. Seventh moon. It's the same damn four moves over and over and over again. And it does not help at all that this game has a lot of dungeon padding either. So like when you have to go find the pillars without giving any additional context, or you have to find now the four whatever again, where you're fighting liter literally a copy paste of the boss, but oh look, it's a different element. It's a totally different boss that just reuses the same element, uh, same attacks just with a different element. And then like every other boss is just that same four set of moves over and over again. I think playing Chrono Trigger in contrast shows like how bad the boss design was for like three quarters of the bosses. Where like, think about like how unique on an SNES game almost every fight in Chrono Trigger was. Like you hit them with the spell, it opens up a weakness. Now you hit them with physical or you hit the side parts and that opens up the boss or potentially leads into like a loop with revives or things like it punishes you for doing this type of attack so you should do this type of attack instead or even just like potentially dealing with like reading what attack the boss is doing to know what like element it's shifting into for resistances there are so many easy examples to name in chrono trigger that these are not optional bosses these are just expected things that happened throughout the entirety of the game. And most of these guys were just big dummies with big stats. Like, you don't really change the strategy at all on like most of the bosses, which is a big unfortunate side effect. They tried to have a concept of bosses having parts where popping them granted you more XP, which I think is interesting. I, I don't think it worked better than what Chrono Trigger did, for example where removing parts of the boss stopped the boss from having attacks, which it kind of did in Wild Arms 2. The problem is that definitely by the end of the game, if you did that, it then just only spammed its best AoE spell over and over and over. 
Like, nine times out of ten, you do that to an optional boss, you do that to an endgame story boss, you do it any time after you get the ability to travel via flight. Nine times out of ten, it's just going to be spamming an AoE attack that, if you are even slightly unprepared for, just makes the boss fight borderline unwinnable and really unfun. Yeah, like, like I, I think, for example, we, like, fought an optional boss, defeated a drill, and then that caused it to stop using any of its other five attacks, and it only spammed its AoE Confuse BS. Like, I don't really find that fun, especially since you would think defeating a drill would just stop a drill attack. Like, I think that would be, like, natural. That would be intuitive. But to then it only doing one attack of its many other options just is, like, absurd. It's stupid. I'm going to be honest with you. And the fact that all of them are just variations of 7th Moon, aka just a high damage AoE spell that basically forces you to have a healer in the party, unless you have one of very specific items, and or potentially the ability to lock their abilities. It just feels very tedious, I guess is the best way to explain most of the late game bosses. So eventually we just ended up out leveling most of the end game by fighting the optional bosses, but not beating all of them because I would not really want to bother with that. And yeah, it just is disappointing. The boss design could have been a whole lot better on a whole. I, I like the physical looks of them. I like the concept of hitting the enemy parts. It would have been nice if with how many gimmicks they have if there was a bit more of a flow. Like, I could give examples of where they had unique AI that didn't follow that pattern. Like, the four copy-paste boss all started with the protective move before they did something else. And weren't just pure RNG slush. There were bosses that do things on set turns, which I think is great. I, I think from a balance perspective, it's nice that their big bad attack should happen potentially consistently, or they give a warning to it so you could react to it. Wild Arms 2 is twice the stuff, half the polish, and like every way you could describe that, pretty much. Where like, like think about even, again, I'm gonna reference Chrono Trigger. You know a big bad attack is gonna happen on certain boss fights, because they'll literally give you countdowns, or you'll be warned that they're charging up. So you have time to react to them. And I feel like it's just kind of missing it, where it's just kind of like you either know or you don't know on a lot of these bosses. And you learn the hard way. And it's not all that fun. Or even compare how like RNG is done across games like Etrian Odyssey, Radiant Historia, or even Chrono Trigger, as we saw at the end of the game. Where you can balance out bosses having like near one-shot abilities. You can balance out bosses having status ailments. But you either have to give the player some time to react to some of it, or put in a system that's a little more fair. Like, when we're fighting basically, like, endgame bosses in Chrono Trigger, even if the attack does, like, 80% of my health, the boss is not then immediately going to do the 80% attack again, and then the 80% attack again. And then the 80% attack again, and then the 80% attack again, and then just normal attack somebody for zero damage. Like, it's just not going to do that in those kinds of games. And the problem is that this one did, where, like, the damage disparity between moves was, like, hilarious. If the boss normal attacks us, literally does 5 damage of our 7,000 health. If it decides it wants to spam 7th Moon and it wants to do 7k, if you can't outheal it, GG. Would you just get straight stat checked? It's over. Sometimes it's elemental, sometimes you have a, a little teeny bit of counterplay with it, and other times it's not elemental and you die. So I don't really find that kind of game design fun for bosses. So I would also hope for Wild Arms 3, they really step it up. There were a few like highlights where bosses did do slightly different things at different HP thresholds, which is a good, you know, that's emblematic of better boss design. But those were kind of the exceptions rather than the standard throughout the game. Wild Arms 2 and Chrono Trigger came out at approximately the same time in their console's life cycle. It's just like, it's just one of those things, like, it might feel unfair to compare to things like Chrono Trigger, which is a great RPG, but like, at the same time, I could just turn to like, where modern games have learned their lesson from literally decades of RPGs, which Wild Arms 2 at this point might, might have been a little later than 1995 in development. I'm just saying, Chad, like, they had some time to think about it. 
um, where we see things where, you know, bosses potentially go in cycles or there's a mix of pattern effects. Like they start with this move, then they do some random moves, then they do like their finisher move. And those random moves will never include like the super attack. Those kinds of things existed in Radiant Historia. I think somebody on stream described it as exploiting the boss. I could not disagree with that philosophy any more wholeheartedly, chat, when I say, that's called good boss design. You are rewarded for learning the mechanics of the boss. That is not a bad thing to have in the game. That is a good thing to have in the game. I don't think it's really fun when it's literally down to a dice roll, whether you potentially advance further in a boss fight. There's not even an argument Crow Trigger was late cycle several lessons learned versus new shiny PlayStation mistake. Yeah, I, it's just one of those things where it's just like, I could not disagree more with the philosophy of this game. And I think a lot of the problem too, is that a lot of options for these optional bosses, which are definitely the challenging part of the game, which it's fair to make it more challenging. I'm not going to say, oh, it's unfair because I can't beat it instantly. I think it's a little unfair that there are a lot of options potentially to deal with the boss, but they're either really, really tedious to find or it's RNG, whether you even come across the thing that helps you. Like, for example, example Necronomicon has a rare drop from a rare enemy that you might not even see or even know exists in the game if you did not play Wild Arms 1. And then you'll have to know that if you played Wild Arms 1, there's an ability called Lucky Shot, and you'll just have to know that the luck-based guy when you combine his ability will do a low damage attack if you spend 100-something meter, and then if it's brought low enough, it'll give you the item guaranteed. It's just so many things that have to happen for you to have, like, the option to then decide to use it in combat. And I think what also hampers this game, and I think what would also remove a lot of my complaints about the combat in this game, there should have been one additional accessory slot for left hand versus accessory. I don't, I never liked it in Wild Arms 1. I hated it more in Wild Arms 2. It felt like there were things that were like mandatory to hold or the boss fight was not winnable. Examples of which would be things like the elemental rings to reduce damage or potentially add damage to your attacks. But then like you can't then also use a shield or use things to buff your stats. So the spellcasters just end up falling like hilariously fall behind because of the fact that it's like, oh, do you want to get like a 50% increase to your damage? Great. Oh, do you not now have the thing that halves elemental resistance? Guess you'll die to the boss now because you don't have enough health. So it's like, oh, and then it's like, oh, now that you survived, oh, gee, that would be a shame. You could do damage if only you had something that boosted your stats. Do you know what I mean, chat? Like, one more accessory slot would have fixed that. And I'm gonna point out Chrono Trigger, because Chrono Trigger avoided this issue, chat. Do you wanna know what they did to avoid this issue? Elemental immunity was on armor. Half resistances were on helmets. There were optional ways to get immunity to status ailments across an accessory, an armor, and a helmet. So I, as a player, got to choose, potentially, what items I think work on certain characters based off of their stats versus I need this, I have only one of this item, I have no choices where this can go. I hope this doesn't just make the character unplayable, question mark. So like just even stuff like that, it's just like so easy to point out where like it, it there's concepts of it that I think makes sense, but I think they miss the big picture and like what makes those other games like really strong, both before this game's time and even to some extent other RPGs in the PS1 era. So I, I don't know, chat. It's just one of those things where it's just like, man, it like imagine if like the melee characters could get the, the reflex or the shield and they can share that slot if they want to to get more defense. Or potentially trade it in for like an elemental attack, which I think is somewhat fair. I just don't think something that is like you're either gonna have 400 in sorcery or 800 or you or or you die it's not really a great thing like elemental resist should be on something that is not one of those mandatory slots i don't know chat i just don't like that game philosophy at all uh let me think positives uh i'm stretching let me think positive things to talk about with the game i think we're near the end of the positives 
I, I'm struggling to think of something positive to say about Wild Arms 2, while keeping it somewhat balanced. There are a lot of things that I feel like just did not gel with the game, sadly. I guess the difficulty was slightly better overall, because there was less of a stat jump than Wild Arms 1. I guess? I guess. I think that's true if you only consider the story characters. Um, I guess it's not a bad thing that they necessarily removed grinding on enemies to power level. Because that was definitely a thing you could exploit in Wild Arms 1 with the lucky cards. And so this game rewarded you a little better for using lucky cards on bosses, which I think is fair. And there were multiple ways to get items like that in order to get additional stats. So that wasn't a bad thing, I guess. Ruffy saying two accessory slots... Plus as many accessory items, so the items are approximately two-thirds as strong numerically outside of immunities. Leave room for more customization offense for defense versus both. Yeah, like, the problem too is, like, let's even just take the elemental rings. There is nothing on that item description that tells you it makes you resistant to the damage of the type that you deal. Go, go look at the item description. It just says, adds fire element to normal attacks. That doesn't say I take half damage from fire. So, I, as I said before, I feel like there's a lot of unfair things. Some of it is on the translation part. And then there's just a lot that is not mechanically explained to you. And some of that is in when you level up and there's just absolutely atrocious garbage skills. That if you take them, they're an absolute waste of your time. Or there's like little pitfalls like that where items have hidden effects. Like the power gauntlet we had earlier, I think had an effect where we would randomly do double damage. But I double-checked just now to make sure I wasn't, like, misremembering. It also applies to spells, even though it adds attack power. So, like, how would you know that? Uh, 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 uh. <laughs> like, question mark? It's not in the item description at all that it does any of that, let alone with spells. Uh, uh. <laughs> just, like, what is that indeed? It's just, like... Again, it feels pretty unfair from the blind player standpoint. There's so many hidden abilities that definitely would change the way you play the game and potentially do offer counter opportunities. But it's just like, you're not really given the tools to really enjoy it. Just very, very unfortunate. Let me think, is there anything else I want to talk about before we talk about the elephant in the room? I think we, com I think we covered combat pretty thoroughly. And again, it's just kind of one of those downside where I did feel like the spellcasters were near useless pretty much all the way through the game until we exploited a power level, and then I could finally AoE spell, like, much earlier than intended, and then I actually had fun with combat for, like, 10 hours, and then the character fell off as soon as we started power leveling, sadly. So sad, chat. If, if only Hello maintained that power start to finish, <laughs> then I would have been happy. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. So, uh, one more thing regarding the crests. I do like the ability of potentially pick and choosing the spells that you do gain. That was the thing that was in Wild Arms 1. The problem, though, is that because some spells are so expensive, even if you have enough crests to select them, they're still basically useless. As I said before, like, the ability to build meter on the spellcasters, like, you never want to attack with them. And if they don't hit you when you defend, because that's a good way to potentially build meter, then you're just wasting turns and they are just absolutely doing nothing. Yeah, and then by the time you start doing AoEs, it's just like, all the other characters just... It's not really needed. Like, okay, let's give an example. Most of the time you fight only between one and three enemies. So like, if you're in normal encounters, why wouldn't you just play three melee characters to one-shot every enemy you fight? Right? Like, it's only until you get, like, really late in the game that you get something that's, like, non-elemental damage to everybody. And then, like, you can do that, and maybe it saves time if you didn't take critical skill. But it's, like, it's... I wouldn't call it more effective than the other options. And if you're willing to use arms, then that's definitely not true. So it just felt real, real weird. Poor, poor Gremlin, so useless. Yeah, we got the late game blue mage that did not receive any useful abilities uh, by the end of the game by just going from what was left of the story and some backtracking areas, to be fair. Um, yeah. 
So let's talk about the let's talk about the elephant in the room, the puzzles. Oh my gosh, the puzzles. Please stop. Wild Arms 2. Worst opening in the game was dealing with the camera in the Magician Girl's starting area. Where she constantly fell off of stuff like an idiot. And then like the constant like there's a lot of memorize this room and duplicate it in another room. There's a lot of, let's just make sure that you, there's only six rooms in this dungeon, but you're damn well gonna spend like, like 40 minutes going through really tedious puzzles, like including but not limited to make statues face the same way, light puzzles, day of the month puzzles, uh, find the hidden thing on the wall puzzles, platforming challenges, Endless push puzzles. Endless push puzzles. Oh my gosh. It just was like, man. The Millennium Puzzle, not that one. Yeah, pretty much. It just like, it really just ground the game to the whole. Like, I don't mind puzzles. Like, a major puzzle in a dungeon. I'm okay with that. Having it like literally every two rooms where some solutions are somewhere between, you know, like two choices, not too bad. Yeah. To like 15 something moves you have to do. It's just so annoying. Yeah, it's just like some things like it's just like one of those things where like they don't even make sense in context of where they are a majority of the time. Like it legitimately felt like puzzles for the sake of puzzles. I'm not even including things where you have to like potentially raise a column to zip line to continue in the dungeon. That kind of stuff would have made sense if those were the puzzles, right? You're rewarding the you know, you remember your throwing knife hits a wall, falls down, can hit a switch. I I'm okay with that. I'm not even considering it in that same realm. I'm talking about, like, the true nonsense of pick a path or tee hee, you have floating blocks in the air. Guess you have to memorize which path is the real path, and there's no visual tell which is the real path. So every time you fall down, you have to leave the room, come back up the stairs, then try the whole thing again. And we're gonna make you go through, like, 70 to 80 tiles. Like, is that, is that really fun? Is that, is that like a fun puzzle, quote unquote? Like, it just, it's just like really mind boggling why half of that stuff is in there. And again, like some of them are just like really awkward and don't really seem to fit in a dungeon. Like dungeons sort of have themes, like we're gradually lowering, lowering water in an area. So like potentially hitting floodgate switches would kind of make sense for like a puzzle. But then you'll just get ones where it's like, do you remember the pattern of eight things that I hit? You better memorize it or you're going to be here a while. Oh, did you not memorize it? Guess you're going to have to do a new pattern. It's just like, why? <laughs> or if he says, like, in a point and click game or a puzzle platformer, it takes one tenth as long to literally do in the puzzle after knowing solutions doesn't take nearly as long. Yeah, there's like a million rotation puzzles. There's things where you have to slide things around, which sometimes makes sense. But again, a lot of them are just like really tedious pick a pass or like what did the day of the months have to deal with anything with like one of the final dungeons of the game? I don't know. We're just, do we're just doing stuff. Like, I don't know what to tell you. Or like, or any of the times where we're having to like babysit a block where it's, it's part of a larger puzzle. But we have to sit through like a really tediously long animation every time we want to go move it. That happened at least five or six different times. Anytime we had to deal with the wind puzzles where we had to watch the platform flip. Like if I like if I want this this state to go from up to sideways because I want to step on it and I have to figure out like the order that I step on these things and rotate them. It'll be like you hit it. Flip 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 done and then you have to do that like 20 more times man did it make the puzzles feel like way more tedious than they should have been your favorites were the one where the decorations around the room that looked like they were for the puzzle only for the puzzle and nothing to do with them and said be written something on the wall oh my gosh yeah that's such a good call out yeah remember we saw like there's a little switch on a wall we try to hit the switch we're like okay we're just not using the right tool on the switch and we're like no <laughs> it's nothing it's nothing to do with the puzzle and how you solve it or they'll purposely put decoys in the puzzles. That's cute. They put things you can move and interact with that don't do anything with the puzzle. That's very rude. It's just like, man, 
man the game got super tedious with those puzzles or oh my gosh speaking of puzzles teleport maze chat why were there so many teleport mazes why was there more than one <laughs> why remember how long that took chat we're going between like three rooms i had to step on like what 14 teleport pads that was insanity why why does stuff like that exist in the game it's not fun <laughs> Oh my gosh. Never forget the teleport puzzles, Chad. The pillars. The pillars broke my mind. Oh my gosh. Horrible. So much teleport puzzle. I don't know what they were thinking. So, like, I wanted to enjoy a lot of the tools and, like, figuring things out. But between, as I said before, like, really long-winded animations and just the, the sheer volume... Like, the fact that it, it was almost literally every two... Like, not an exaggeration. Every two rooms, there's, like, a hallway, puzzle. Hallway, puzzle. Hallway, puzzle. Hallway, puzzle. For, like, hours is too much. I'm, I'm not sorry. That was just, like... And they're not even, like, fun, either. Murphy says, puzzle with a five-piece solution, six pieces is a solid puzzle. The same puzzle when you have to use a robot chop six is two-second latency to solve it. It's not a good puzzle. Yeah. Drew tools except roll. Oh, I was about to call that out. So I do like the concept of the tools. So here's my positive. I do like that some of the tools help you uh, both in and out of puzzles, like detecting if you've missed any hidden items or potentially things that improve your movement. I think those are good things that, you know, you don't have to make them overly complicated for them to be useful. And I think that's a good thing downside there were tools that were like yeah you're gonna use this tool like six times and never again <laughs> like just legitimately they don't have an alternate purpose they're just terrible like the the the, the rollerblades was increasingly funny we got it like midway through the game and you would think something that makes you move fast is useful except like in wild arms one you can't change direction you move forward until you hit a wall but if you hit an edge of a cliff you fall off and it resets you in the room so like almost all of the later dungeons in the game it was very rare you could ever move in a straight line and not fall off into the bottomless abyss it was very very rare that we would hit an opportunity to have like a long straight away or be able to aim diagonally towards a wall and ricochet into something useful so i think even just like the level design itself was not really suited for all of the tools except for this specific bs puzzle that they want you to go through whether you're Stepping on platforms to move them to another place, to then teleport to another one, to then zip to this one, to then do this, to then do that, blah, blah, blah. I'm gonna skip that one. No, I don't know, Chad. It just, it left a bad taste in my mouth. I would have preferred less tools and for them to be more useful than to have the sheer volume. Because having six characters with that many tools is just kind of, eh. I'm still recovering from the puzzles, chat. There, there were just way too many. Yeah, the teleport puzzles, plus push block, plus all these other things, plus do this. There's also, like, hidden uses of tools that weren't, like, immediately obvious either. Like, I like that we could go through the whole game, and the ice rod bit does almost nothing to most things. And then there's, like, one platform we specifically have to freeze, and that is the only time you have to freeze a platform in order to use it, and you never see it again. There's a lot of, like, one-off uses of the tool that are not really introduced to you in a way that would make you immediately think between your wall of, like, 15 choices that that's the obvious answer. My favorite one was us trying to figure out even just how to operate a switch, where, like, we have a kick ability, we have a knife, we have a hook shot, but clearly we have to use a bomb to t make a change of color. Do you know what I mean, chat? Like, there are just some things where they just didn't feel intuitive. I was like, why did kicking it or, or using a knife not count towards it? Why, why limit the player in doing that? So, just overall, did not like the puzzles. Definitely way too many of them. And I think that contributes to the biggest problem in the game itself, pacing. The game's pacing was atrocious. It was so bad. I think chat agreed with me without going into spoilers. That ending sequence with the unskippable dialogue was agony. Agony how slow that was with the pacing. Or like the really awkward dialogue that just didn't lead anywhere because the translation was really awkward. Or the fact that instead of just letting you do something, you're gonna have to do a puzzle in between. 
like oh are you in the middle of a ship that's falling to the earth and or rising into the sun and you could die at any minute why don't we have a six person or five person split party for like 45 minutes of you rotating through characters to escape like it just e even in universe it makes no sense i'm like are you telling me that we're about to die any minute and i had enough time to use like 120 uses of the tool in order to solve this increasingly improbable layout of rooms in order to escape like how did these people even leave their own ship <laughs> like i just have honest questions like the puzzles just didn't really make sense for the context they were in they didn't make sense in like the larger scheme of how they're done it just it was just painful so if you compile all of those issues with the slower combat or potentially force encounters, there were actually force encounters. It was doing so well until the end of the game where force encounters were mandatory. Um, it was just, ugh. Like, imagine you're about to fight the final boss and the game is like, you know what you need? You need a rotate statue puzzle. Like, really? Like, we've already done the, we're channeling the spirits of Earth, semi-spoilers there, I guess, in the non-spoiler part. But it's like, but then after seeing a scene like that, you're gonna, like, ditz around with a statue? Terrible, what were they thinking? It's like, it's actual madness. Like, someone sat there and went, you know what the players want after doing three boss fights? Why don't we just make them do another puzzle to get to the next boss? Why? Why? Or like the, or I guess also lose spoilers, or like the goofy moving floors when you're in some of the individual solo sections that are literally there just to disorient you and waste your time. The puzzle is, can you solve walking through the slippery floor? Like, come on. Why is that stuff in the game, chat? Like, honestly. Especially compared to Chrono Trigger, definitely. It's just like, as I said before, you can have puzzles. It just, I just don't think they should be in that volume. And I don't think using tools for movement counts towards that. I would rather it see it more like that than the nonsense that we were dealing with through majority of the game. It's like, ugh, going through those things. Like we're, we're arranging statues and like an order based off a of riddle on the wall, etc., etc. Even though the rest of the dungeon has nothing to do with these statues or even the theme of the riddle itself. It reminds me of like a Valkyrie profile hard mode dungeons where those were my least favorite dungeons in that kind of game. Except if every dungeon was like that. <laughs> Wild Arms 2 where it's just non-stop puzzles. But anyway. I think that's about as far as I could go from non-spoiler territory. Just thinking if there's any other things I want to add before we go into more spoilers. I think that's about it. I think that's about it. Yeah, I definitely think them allowing us to name all the characters was a mistake, but a wonderful mistake. <laughs> so positive there from the spoilers. Uh, pretty much all the named characters, except for two, I think you could play as. The, with the portrait. If they have a portrait, you know they're your playable character kind of thing. Oh, I guess there's more than that. We technically name characters like Star Pupil, etc. Uh, I guess that's not true. But either way, from the standpoint, it is very amusing that you can name them dumb things to entertain yourself, because a lot of them just speak nonsense. You might as well find enjoyment in the game where you can. Um, As I said before, a lot of the game's issues have to deal with, like, the way they introduce the abilities and even the order that they introduce them. I think giving AoE weapons to characters like Brad and Bashley, for example, in our playthrough, that's what we called them, um... Uh, it just wasn't that great like as i said before pass a, a third way through the game then you get access to like bashley's super form and then that completely invalidates everything that he has you might as well as not even bother having arms at that point um i feel like the spellcasters were okay if we did not power level hello so that way we don't have to just kill X number of enemies to learn a spell, which is already kind of a tedious way to learn things. And switching mediums allows you to kind of gate what spells you learn. I don't think I would have liked Hello. I don't think I honestly would have used them if not for the XP exploit. Like, its first aid was useful. But, like, 
if we were doing it from a if he did not have AoE spells from 47 unlocked pretty early on, I don't think I would have used them as much. He had like near immunity to every boss due to how like the personal skill on level up for defense worked. So technically he was tanky despite having like half the health of most of the characters by that point. All the spells, all the playable characters. Yeah, what the sad thing is you can name all the crest spells, but you can't name Hello's abilities for some reason. That's disappointing. I don't know, chat. I will say in general... I don't know. I, I think this game just kind of missed the mark. I love, I love the songs in the game. The cinematics were decent. I'm never going to be, like, super wowed by them unless they give, like, a super good performance or something. Oh, now I'm remembering this one. <laughs> the disc 1 to disc 2 transition where you blow up the, uh... Basically, the, the nuclear weapon, which also is very confusing in the, in the translation. I wonder if it actually was a nuclear weapon or if they just meant a weapon of mass destruction. Cinemax were decent, but the intro got boring about seeing it 20 times. Yeah, that's a weird choice that on load up the, the intro plays. I'm just thinking of this where it looks like there's moments of the game that could have worked if the plot wasn't like indecipherable, where art is talking about some random components of something and then never goes back to it because it's just utter gibberish. But man, oh man, chat. It, it definitely needed a lot more polish on pretty much every foreseeable level. Like, start to finish, it's a very flawed game. I can see where people can have some fun with it. It's not that I didn't have fun with portions of the game, but definitely it was just like, the equivalency of doing like the, the Final Fantasy 1, you must now refight these enemies, now you must go to the elemental temples. Any game that has that kind of template is usually kind of a big turnoff for me. And the midway point of the game where you're hunting down the pillars and then the four additional arms, for example, I just don't really enjoy that style of gameplay. Zesteria did that as well. I just don't, I just don't know. It just like compared to like any of the other really good RPGs that we played on stream and even to an extent Wild Arms 1, even if I don't put that on the same level as like a Chrono Trigger or a Valkyrie Profile or a Radiant Historia. Um, I just feel like it was just so lacking in that sense. So I'm hoping that with their experiment with the Force system, they really rebalance spell costs, that they really give a buff back to utility spells so that way my spellcaster can do something while they're waiting for their abilities. I would like for melee weapons on magicians to finally do something. I'm tired of having characters like Vicky and Hello, where it's like, hey, you got this magic staff. Now you can do 300 more physical attack with the thing you'll never use because it's useless. Like, it, it's just one of those things where I'm like, please, why don't you put the magic boost on that weapon and resolve one of my complaints about needing a spare slot for the sorcery boost? You know what I mean, chat? Like, these are just, like, really basic things that I can think of in, like, 30 seconds that would have made the game so much more enjoyable with, like, minimal change. And a lot of it has to do, as I said before, with, like, the personal level ups, the equipment, some of the combat animation. A modern take would be to speed up the animations. To, well, technically not even modern. That existed in Chrono Trigger. But just, like, little things that would have removed a lot of the tedium. I think that was in the game. Um, I will say I don't feel the characters were all that endearing for the most part. And again, a lot of that has to do with the translation issue. Though I am kind of curious if there was like a better translation of the game, quote unquote. I almost wonder if it would have been worth playing over this one. But we got to experience it how other people played it. For better or for worse, I suppose. But yeah, there were just a lot of subsystems I just don't feel really worked. There's not really much to spoil in the game. I mean, it's it's kind of one of those things where it's just like your party of six gathers eventually. You have to defeat the big bad, but oh no, the big bad is not the big bad you thought it was. And there's a real big bad behind it. But oh no, that's not the true big bad. You have to deal with the thing that it was being alluded to at the beginning of the game. That's the true big bad. 
Like, I feel like that's a pretty accurate summary of the game. <laughs> the whole thing with, like, Lord Blazer being the final boss was, like, not a surprise, for example. You're endeared to Ard. That's fair. So, it's just kind of one of those things where it wasn't, like, the most compelling of stories. I'm not really big into ones that are also very military-themed in general, where we're just kind of following instructions for the sake of it. I like being kind of independent and doing my own thing, and this game very much tried to involve politics, which it kind of works, but also kind of doesn't due to the translation. There are some pretty goofy moments. I, I think that, like, uh, like weird random scenes that popped out of my head were, like, when Villain was giving his speech and he kept popping up on random things, like reflections in water. That was a really weird plot element, chat. <laughs> it's like... Like, what is happening? Never forget, Chad. He had the fountain speech. And then he was also on the stained glass, I think, for some reason. He did whatever he wanted, Chad. That's basically what it came down to. The blaze of destruction, Lord Blaze of the Fire, Lord of Flaming Destruction and Fire, pretty much. So, yeah, there were elements of it that I think would have been good. Lord, hey, I'll tell you my weakness, Blazer. Yeah, that's true. <laughs> You'll never use a thing that could defeat me. I'm totally going to die to that in a single hit. But surely you, not a hero, could never wield the Sword of Heroes. Like, yeah, good one on that one. Yeah, th there is just some moments where I'm like, oh, okay. It kind of gave me some reminiscent moments where we had the codec calls. I think that was, I guess, a positive thing. If you forgot where you were in the plot, you could do the codec call to get some hints as to where to go. I guess that was decent. Oh, I almost forgot about one of the most important mechanics. Screw the luck system in this game, chat. Oh my gosh, it's terrible. The fact that, like, you need to be at max luck for to enter certain dungeons or status ailments are just atrocious throughout the game due to the fact that your luck score randomly raises or lowers depending on your level. Or if you keep using the in, it tends to lower. It is quite terrible. I, I hope they could remove that mechanic. I would never miss it. It's technically unique to the game, but what does it add? Nothing other than disappointment. I guess we could say pickpocket worked more than in Wild Arms 1. I, I guess that's one of the few things that improved between games. We didn't just pickpocket something to death because our character is too stupid to steal. So that's good, I guess. Oh yeah, there was literally the... It was like the good luck zone. But there's no... There's only a couple items that raise luck, but it's also luck that your luck is high enough to also be high enough to enter that dungeon, even with them. So... Great mechanic, guys. It worked better in that we actually saw it work. That's true. It is technically an infinity percent improvement. But yeah, I just didn't like the breakdown of the spells even between the characters. As I said before, we should have had AoEs. There's, you know what? You know what would have solved their problem? There should have been low-level AoEs and high-level AoEs. It's almost like they could have copied what Final Fantasy VI and Chrono Trigger did, where you fire Fireaga, <laughs> you know, and Fyra. Do you know what I mean, chat? It's almost like those systems do that for a reason. <laughs> It's almost like they, they should have scaled it a little better. They had two tiers, and one is basically unusable more than half the game, unless you're specifically against a boss fight, where it won't be as useful because its big usefulness is AoE, which is the thing you really want more than the elemental damage. Like, it's nice it does more damage, don't get me wrong, but, like, you really just want to be able to just crowd wipe everything. Very silly. But yeah, there's only a handful of bosses where it felt like they were slightly more unique. Like, we had some dialogue back and forth. I think some of the human bosses were coded a little better. A little bit than some of the other ones. The elemental guardians of the pillars were okay. I just wish they weren't literally copy-pasted from each other. If, if it had been in standalone, I probably would have been like, Okay, it's nice that they have a set move into some randomness. And if you do this, then, you know, expect them to do that. But yeah, pretty much start to finish. I think the game just... Mm. 10 out of 10 to the composer, though. They did a good job. <laughs> they they have nothing to be ashamed of or rethink, I think. We, di we didn't even have, like, a Peruti song in the soundtrack. So they, they, did a, they did a good job. But oh boy, chat. Just... Ugh. 
this game was very mentally draining and physically draining. So I think with that chat, we've gone a little over time because we were sitting through that horrible, like 20 minute ending cutscene that ended in gibberish. <laughs> what are the baby's names? Oh, how embarrassing. No, what, what, were, the, what were their names? I like, know. No, I, I vaguely I vaguely am interested. Are you hinting to Wild Arms 3? What are you doing? Are you sequel baiting me? But yeah, other than that, chat, I don't know. Do you want to give any final thoughts, chat? For people that only saw a couple sessions, it's okay to talk about what you saw. But for people that have been there since the beginning, do you feel anything was missed that I should go in more detail? Is there, there's, as I said before, there's not a lot to spoil with the game. The story is like borderline incomprehensible throughout the game. There's, for some reason, more than one prison visit. For some reason. Parameter says, the names were how embarrassing. That's true. If I was being tortured, I had to choose between Terranigma and Wild Arts 2. I'd rather play Terranigma. That is, that is a scorching hot take, and I almost have to agree with you. I think that's actually sad. I think that's actually sad. I think that I think where the big issue is is that as much as I didn't enjoy Terra Enigma as a game, I feel like other than like the really stupid points where you have to power level in order to even hit the robot in that game, at least like the pacing of the dungeons, even though there were like some puzzles and there were some acrobatics, the dungeons took way less time and the dialogue could skip so fast. You could skip it so fast. Yeah, so I just, I, I think that's a true statement. I would rather have an action game because if we're comparing combat speeds, it's so much faster than the slow combat in Wild Arms. You're not dealing with like walls of text. You're still looking for dumb NPCs to trigger the plot flag. That's not really different between the two games. So that, that that's kind of a neutral draw between the two of them. I like the soundtracks in both, so I don't, I don't give that to one or the other. But yeah, I just feel like there was more nonsense. Oh, actually, chat, I almost forgot. One of the most BS moments. Hey, chat, remember when we went to Rumble City and there's that one NPC that if we talk to is a hint to get to the uh, the hidden laboratory and we have no reason to put that character, aka the hidden character, in the front of our party in order to talk to them and unlock that lab? Holy strategy guide moment with that game. What are they thinking with some of this dialogue? Like, it makes sense when, like, you talk to the love interest with the protagonist that's associated with them and dialogue advances. Like, that's fair. But, like, some of that was just, like, absolute, like, like, almost table flip moments. Or <laughs> just, like, it's just, like, what is happening? Why did that advance that? Yeah, just, there's so many questionable things in this game. I think it also kind of had a too many boss problem. I mean, there were like, what, a hundred bosses or something? Like, not an exaggeration. We fought one like every 30 minutes, roughly. Unless we're in puzzles, then it's like 45 minutes. Whereas <laughs> those puzzles were a majority of the game like. Honestly, we played for about 30 hours, a little over 30 hours. And I almost guarantee you like 15 hours of that was horrible puzzles. I almost guarantee it. Not even combat or dialogue. It was just awful puzzles. So yeah, I think I'm inclined to agree. I think with the weirdness where like if you're looking at something and you rotate the camera, you're not actually looking at it because your character sprite is not actually facing tr correctly in the direction that you're looking. I think I remarked in the final dungeon of this game when we were trying to teleport between places that Hello's feet are not facing the direction that I'm tapping and that caused me to get confused a couple times. So like if I'm looking to the right, his feet are facing to the bottom right. So it looks like if I were to hit something, I should teleport to the bottom right because that's where my feet are facing. Where there's other times where it looks like I'm looking straight ahead to the right, but I'm actually looking at an angle and that's because of the weird sprite that they used. So there's a couple, not a couple times, that happens several times, uh, where I'm trying to throw something which has like a thin hitbox and it misses because I'm not aligned with it because the sprite is not A, where I'm throwing it from and B, is also not quite facing the same direction I'm actually facing. So definitely, uh, definitely needs improvement. We're, we're gonna put that stamp on this game. There were moments I had fun with it, but 
I think between like the pacing of the story with the horrible puzzles and the awful spinny nonsense pillar dungeons that made me both annoyed at the game's puzzles and and sick with motion sickness that was quite a testament to how not to do games honestly though did i did i hate it as much as terra enigma probably not would i rather play terra enigma again over wild arms 2 sadly yes so i i think that's i think that's a good summary for our stream right there chat it's it's on the same tier as terra enigma for me so they have a lot that they could potentially improve. Maybe we'll check out Wild Arms 3, but it won't immediately be tomorrow or anything. But anyway, chat, uh, let's let's end the review here. I don't have anything else to say. Turning the replay when? Yeah, whatever. Maybe if I'm at max level with cheats, then we'll have fun with the game. But anyway, chat, let's, let's go ahead and say goodbye to YouTube. So... So long, Wild Arms 2. I will not miss you, but I will think about you, potentially, in, like, a fever dream. Oh, actually, one more thing. To all the people that, that came in and were saying, like, I was having a love-hate relationship with the game, there was no love. Let me be clear. <laughs> the enjoyment of the game ended somewhere in the 10-hour mark. It was just persistence, because I'm hoping the third game will be better. This was, like, the... Shadow Hearts of the New World of the Shadow Hearts series. <laughs> we could do better. I, they can recover from this. This isn't like a deal breaker, but it was a very disappointing game. So anyway, thank you all for watching, and I guess see you in whatever the next game is.